Welcome to Question Time. Tonight we're in Dorking. On tonight's panel, Chris Philp, Government Minister for Tech and the Digital Economy, previously Minister for Immigration Compliance. Wes Streeting, Labour's Shadow Health Secretary and former Shadow Minister for Child Poverty. Leila Moran, Spokesperson on Foreign Affairs for the Liberal Democrats and a candidate for party leader in 2020. Journalist and political correspondent at GB News, Tom Harwood. And former Conservative Minister and leadership candidate, now no longer a member of the party, author and podcaster Rory Stewart. Welcome to my panel, welcome to our audience here in Dorking, great to see you and of course welcome to you at home as well. Joining the conversation the usual way on social media at BBC Question Time and we'll see, see what you've got to say about tonight's topics. Okay, our first question tonight is from Chris Dimmock. If over 40% of my company didn't think I was a competent leader, I would leave. How can Boris stay um, as leader knowing he doesn't have the backing of his party? Well, Roy, you wanted to be leader at one stage. What's your view? I, I, I think he, he should go. And, and one of the strange things about it is that uh, it's a sort of strange bit of maths, but essentially all the ministers and the PPS is the payroll, the people who get salaries from the prime minister, are expected to vote for him. So in fact, the figures are closer to 75% of his backbenchers having voted against him. This is worse than happened to Theresa May. Mm -hmm. Of course, we don't know that everyone on the payroll did actually we, vote. We, we don't, but we can assume that people on the payroll voted for the Prime Minister. And the bigger issue, though, I think is about governing. The bigger issue is that he is now fighting for his survival day in, day out. It's going to be very, very difficult to produce good long-term policies for the country because all that Downing Street is thinking about is the next newspaper headline, and that is no way to govern a country. Chris. Well, look, he got 60% of the votes in that leadership ballot on Monday. If you look at the election results that Wes, Layla, and I got at the 2019 general election, none of us in our three respective constituencies got 60%. We got all of us but less than 60. My, it wasn't just Hang on, let me, fin let me finish. Let it me wasn't finish. just Lib Dems so who got, voted. So that got, was the Tories who voted so he got, for Look, he got 60%. <laughs> he, got 60 okay, he got 211 votes. That's more than he got when he ran for leader to start with. I think Conservative MPs, uh, those who didn't vote for him, which was 148, so a fair number, 40%, as the questioner said, now accept the result. Because when you stand for having an election in a democracy, uh, you, unlike Donald Trump, you accept the result and you then get on with it. And what we now need to do to win trust, I think, is deliver on important things. We saw the speech today up in Blackpool on increasing home ownership, getting more homes built. Uh, I mean, today in my job, I've been working on the online safety bill to make the UK the safest place in the world to be online, get Facebook and Google and so on under control. We're going to be reviewing the gambling laws. We're launching a digital strategy next week. Uh, we already have the lowest unemployment in 50 years, but there's more to do on the economy, which I suspect we may discuss later. So our job now, I think, is to put this uh, debate about leadership behind us. We had the vote, we've got a result. Now let's concentrating, concentrate on making things better for our country. That's what the public expects us to do. There'll be an election in a couple of years when they can deliver their verdict. And I think the verdict the public will, will, will give us is going to be based on delivery and track records. That is what everybody in the Conservative Party, from top to bottom, okay. regardless of how they voted, now needs to concentrate on doing. Uh, Chris, you asked this question. Um... If 40% of your company didn't think you were a competent leader, you would leave. Can I just ask, are you a Conservative voter? Yes. And, and what's your, what would your answer be to the question? Um, well, I would just feel uncomfortable going in, uh, if I was, I guess if I was a leader, it's uncomfortable knowing that a high percentage of my company didn't, wasn't backing me. I just feel really uncomfortable. And do you think Boris Johnson should resign? Should um, go? Yeah, I think so. I think he's made enough mistakes to, to warrant that. Um, and would, if he stays, would it change how you vote, just out of interest? It would certainly make me think, yes, but not definitely. OK. Leila. Well, I look at this psychodrama that happened on Monday. I think back to, you know, the weeks that we've had running up to this. I think about the cost of living crisis in my constituents who are just absolutely up against it. And what they want is a leader who's going to deliver for them. And that leader is not Boris Johnson. He hasn't been already. He's completely distracted. Um, Chris, you said that there's a general election. At that point, people will decide. Well, there are some by-elections coming up too. And I was in Tiverton and Honiton the other day. 
I was talking to people in both of those towns. And I'll tell you what, he may have the confidence of his MPs, but he does not have the confidence of the people, and certainly not of the people I was speaking to. They were angry, they were dismayed. And remember, this is a man who said quite recently that he would do it all again, all of that partying, he would do it again. People don't want that. They want a leader who's got integrity and honesty. They want good old fashioned British values back where a man's word is his bond. That's not Boris Johnson. And I think if people want to send a message to this government about what they think of Boris Johnson, they should consider voting Liberal Democrat in that by-election on the 23rd of June, because that's the way to do it. OK, let's hear from the man in the green shirt, and the green jacket and the blue shirt there in the middle. It just seems to me there's no obvious successor. So um, we're basically just uh, Boris can remain in power as long as anybody else uh, comes forward, or doesn't come forward. And you'd like to see that? Yeah. OK. And the woman back there with the dark top on, I can't quite see what you're wearing. Yes, with your hand up. The thing that strikes me about Boris Johnson is no matter what happens, no matter how many things he gets wrong, no matter how many people criticise him, he seems to have a pathological shamelessness. He's never going to go of his own volition. Mm. They were saying, they were briefing earlier this week that he only needed one vote, um, one, 50 plus one, to get through. He, he doesn't care. He will stay until he is marched out of there. Most leaders would, would walk at some point, but for me, I look at him and I think he just, he just doesn't care. He will just stay until he's dragged out. OK, man here in the blue shirt. Is it not fair to say that um, it's a case of uh, employing yes-men uh, that are around you that sort of won't Why are you say... talking about Chris here? Well, <laughs> I've, not, I've not seen anybody that's actually criticised anything that he's done. All they've done is defend um, the disgusting behaviour that he has that he rules your party. OK, Chris, I'll come back to you on that. And the man here at the front. Uh, part of the problem is, is that this will stay in the news agenda now because next we'll have the Privileges Committee in October and if he's found to have misled Parliament, Chris, I know you supported him uh, on, the, uh, on Monday, would you still support him if he's found guilty of misleading Parliament? Would you? Well, I think I'm not going to speculate about hypotheticals, but if I mean, but I, but I, but I, but I will say, but what, I, what it is, but look, I mean, I think I'm going to take that report very seriously, and I think all MPs will take that report very seriously, regardless of political party, because integrity is important. There's a, it's a cross-party committee, as you probably know. There's, um, I think Harriet Harman's going to chair it now, isn't she? Who's obviously widely respected. Um, there's um, MPs from different parties on that, and we're all going to study that very carefully. And what about what the man said here in terms of yes men surrounding? Boris Johnson, just briefly, because I thought... Well, look, I mean, I, I don't really accept that. We have robust debates, but obviously as a, part, as, a, as a team in government, you have those debates normally behind closed doors, and you agree a position and you stick to it, okay. and if you disagree, then you leave government. Uh, I wanted to pick up on a point that Leila Moran made about delivery. She said what people want to see is delivery. And if you look at the substance of what Boris Johnson has achieved, the lowest unemployment for 50 years, no, no, you said record that. You NHS spending, you know, police recruitment heading towards 20,000, these are okay. real achievements that make a difference, I think. OK. Tom. It's tricky, isn't it, looking at Monday's vote? You've got 148 Conservative MPs who said they didn't have confidence in the Prime Minister. And looking at what those 148 Conservative MPs have said over the last six months, it's not really a unified group. It's a very disparate coalition. <clears throat> and I just don't get the feeling that every one of those MPs was voting on wine or cheese or indeed curry or beer. Those MPs were voting, maybe it was a catalyst, what went on with the Sue Gray report, but there was a general sense of malaise about how this government has been performing, about the constant U-turns, about the uh, judgery quality of it, about the uh, easily influenced nature of how the media or how interest groups or even opposition politicians can push this government from one policy to another. This was a Prime Minister who stood to become leader of the Conservative Party on a policy plank of cutting taxes, of growing the economy, of deregulating, of seizing the opportunities that Brexit might provide. And his Premiership, for whatever reason, well, COVID, got knocked off course after uh, March 2020. It's been a premiership that has been really uh, battered by events, and I think a lot of people have been deeply frustrated in that. So the question so is, extent, how can Boris stay as a leader knowing so he doesn't have the backing so, so, of his party? So I'm coming, so I'm coming to this. Because, OK, you just need to get there because, a bit more quickly. <laughs> <laughs> because, it's, because it's not just about Sue Gray. 
He can win back the confidence of some of those MPs by trying to govern as he promised to, by delivering a policy agenda that he knows will work. And indeed, in the speech that he gave today, we didn't hear a lot of detail, I hope. I really hope that detail is to come. Mm. But he started to talk about how taxes okay. may be brought down, about how, how houses may be built, about how we may be able to slash tariffs on imports, about how we may be able to deregulate the economy. If that starts to be a record that revs up the economy, that moves us on from the sclerotic position we are projected to be in, if he starts to get results, that's how he wins back his party, but it's a conditional. Man at the back there, in the dark shirt. I think there's a sort of wider question here, which is one about accountability and who the Prime Minister is accountable to. And I think the concern is that the accountability is towards members of his own party, many of, may, many of whom may be behaving for honourable reasons, but many of them may be worrying about their own chances in the next mm -hmm. election. And rather than being accountable to a set of parliamentary standards, or indeed what I believe Prime Ministers used to be account accountable to, which was to a code of honour, if they'd failed in a certain way, I now feel quite disheartened because it seems to me that there's no way that I have a voice in any accountability for what he might do. And everything is channeled through a bunch of his colleagues in the same party who don't represent a set of standards and don't represent necessarily a code. They may do individually a, co a code of honour. And that, I think, is most concerning because once you lose the code of honour, there's nobody that they're accountable, he's accountable to. And nobody. And, and this is, we're in this discussion about his own party at the moment and whether they want to keep him or not or whether he does a good job. Lots of what, 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 but not enough about how. And I think that's, um, that's a concern. OK. And the woman just along from me in the white cardi. How do you think Boris Johnson would fare in a public vote of no confidence? Because I feel the same mm. apathy now towards British politics after, I've, after everything that's happened. Well, of course, there is such a thing. It's a general election. And I guess we will find out. Uh, Wes? No. I don't know what people are expecting to change. This is who Boris Johnson is. This is who he has always been, and he will never change. And the reason why he's able to stay on, despite losing the confidence of 40% of his MPs, is because the majority of the Conservative Party's MPs are willing to tolerate the intolerable, and to defend the indefensible, and to look the other way, even as Boris Johnson bulldozes through the very basic standards of public life that every politician should abide by and every politician should be held accountable to. And as for delivery, OK, the Tories are trying to recruit 20,000 more police officers to replace the 21,000 that they scrapped. We've got the highest taxes since just after the Second World War, 15 tax rises in the last two years, and people are paying more and getting less. The largest NHS waiting lists in history, and they were at record levels before the pandemic, before Chris tries to blame those on schools. The gap between kids from the richest and poorest backgrounds is widening. Life expectancy in this country is, is lessening. People are dying earlier. And if that's not enough, if we want a human illustration of what is fundamentally wrong in our country, it's the fact that despite the, all the pressures that the NHS is currently under, there are hospitals in this country who are opening food banks, not to serve the local community, but to serve their own staff because they are so poorly paid and so poorly treated. If that's a record that Boris Johnson wants to stand on, if that's a record that Chris wants to defend, then bring it on. And if the Tories are stupid enough to lead, uh, be led into the general election by Boris Johnson, give me a choice of Keir Starmer and Boris Johnson every day of the week and twice on polling day. OK, Rory, you um, want to come back in? So, I, I think... <laughs> One of the real sadnesses here is that Boris Johnson clinging on by his fingernails to, to number 10 is, is stopping British politics refreshing itself. British politics is becoming really dismal. Very, very sadly, the opposition is much, much better at criticising than producing any positive policies of its own. I think there is a huge va vacant hole in the centre of British politics for practical, sensible politics. And instead, we're going into some kind of bizarre version of Berlusconi's Italy. And the reason he can't govern is that every week there's going to be another scandal. There's going to be another by-election loss. There's going to be another parliamentary committee. And every week we're going to have this list of mays. He's, he may do something on housing. He may do something on tax. He'll rehash another press release to try to get him through the week. Let's get rid of Boris. And when we do, let's make a better British politics. But Rory, you're talking about... <laughs>
We're talking about moving to this mythical centre of British politics. What has this government been, other than sti sti sticking itself in the soggy centre of British politics, uh, with, with, a, with high taxing and high spending and all the rest that goes along with it? Uh, Boris Johnson has governed, I would have thought, in sort of your ideal uh, situation when it comes to tax, spend, regulation, or indeed much social policy. This has been a very, very centrist government. It's not, not at all. I think... The centre of British politics is about integrity. And in the end, the single thing that compromises everything he does is the lack of trust, the lack of integrity. He lurches sometimes to the right, sometimes to the left, but always in the direction of his own self-interest. OK. I'm going gonna... I'm gonna to move on. Because there's a lot of questions I'd like to get through tonight. But before I do, I just want to tell you that uh, next week the programme will be coming from Newcastle. The following week we are in Stratford-upon-Avon. That's the 23rd of June. By-election night. Should be interesting. So if you'd like to apply for either of those audiences, if you live in and around Newcastle or Stratford-upon-Avon, we'd love to hear from you. Just go to the Question Time website and follow the instructions there. OK, let's take our next question now, which is from Sarah Howard. Do you support the upcoming transport strikes? Does Labour support them, Wes? Well, I wish they weren't going ahead, and so does the RMT. I listened to their General Secretary, Mick Lynch, on LBC just the other week, saying that he doesn't want his members out on strike. I think people don't realise that when workers go on strike, they lose a day's pay, and I don't think anyone wants to be losing a day's pay against the current backdrop. But do why you support... Well, this, why, the question well, is, do you support Fiona. the strikes? Why are strikes? they going on strike? To defend their pay, jobs, terms and conditions. That is what any of us would be doing for our own jobs, pay, terms and conditions in the current climate. What needs to be done to avoid these strikes going ahead? The government needs to do what the government should be doing, which is providing a table for people to get around to try and negotiate a fair settlement for the workers that keeps the trains running and treats people fairly. Instead, what they're trying to do is pour petrol on the fire, pick a fight with the railway unions, because they hope that starting a fire on railways will distract from Boris Johnson's problems. That's not responsible government. And when you've got the rail operators saying, oh, we want to negotiate, you've got the RMT saying we don't want to go on strike. It's the responsibility of government to get people around the table. And I'll tell you what might fix our broken railways. Instead of people paying high fares in this country that subsidise fares in France, in Germany, in Holland, because they own our railways and we don't, why don't we for, for finally get a grip on our own railways, put them back in public ownership so that we can reinvest the profits in better services and lower fares for people in Britain? Yeah. You've not actually answered the question. Do you support the upcoming transport strikes, yes or no? Well, I, as I say, I prefer they weren't You wish they weren't ahead, happening, but do you support no, them? No, genuinely, if I were... If, look, put it this way. If I, so if I were a member of the RMT and my jobs were at risk like this, then I would be, I'd be voting to go on strike and I'd be voting to defend my jobs, terms and conditions. If I were a government minister right now, it's not my job to be on the picket line or it's not my job to be condemning unions. It's my job to solve the problem, to get people okay. around the table, to Sarah, make sure passengers are aren't inconvenient. Does that answer your question? Not really, no. Right, OK. <laughs> well, we had a go. Leila, would you like to answer it? Do the Liberal Democrats support the upcoming rail strikes? I support people's right to strike. I don't think this is the right time, and so the answer's no. And the reason for that is because it's more than just their pay and conditions. There are lots of people up and down this country, not least public sector workers, trying to get to work. The nurses that service my local hospital use those trains. They're not going to be able to get in. The same kids who have had two years now of disrupted learning. I used to be a physics teacher, by the way, before I was an MP. Physics exams are on Thursday, the 23rd, as well. They are not going to be able to get to their exams that day because of the trains not going. It is a failure, by the way. I don't think the workers are to blame here. It is well, not even the, thing, the unions though, You've just who are... Against it working. is not You're the saying unions it's nurses who are versus railway workers. That's not here. good choice. I think what we need... And actually, I would agree with you, Wes, on one point, which is that they need to get back round the table. I would urge them, please, please don't do this. For the sake of my constituents who are up against it, don't do it. But boy, 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 it's not too late. It doesn't have to happen. But it's not just on the RMT, though, is it? Let it's about hear, the other side, Let too. me hear from the audience. Yes. Um, I totally disagree about nationalising the railways. Look what's happened in Scotland. This is not going to solve the problem. Okay. The man in the blue shirt there. 
Uh, I understand that Lisa Nandy came out in support of the, of the strike. Well, I'll tell you what she said. She said, we want to avoid the strikes. We're on the public side on this. We're also on the rail workers' side. So make of that what well, you my, want. Well, my, yeah. my, my issue is... Well, yeah. My issue is this. The average salary of a railway <laughs> worker, I think, is double that of a paramedic. So I find it very difficult to understand how you can justify that, that disparity. So the average rail worker salary is, is, is 44,000. I mean, there may be overtime in that, but it's, it's 44,000. Uh, teachers, for example, 37,000. Nurses, I've got it here somewhere, about an 30, average 000. of 31,000. So that, that's kind of what we're talking about. The man there in the grey top. It seems to me that um, the Wes's position is just a bit opportunistic. He seems to not realise, you know, we're, we're, we have now a country where you know, half the population have forgotten what it was like when the railways were nationalised. I'm, you know, I'm among that half who's too young to remember it, but my parents and grandparents tell me it was pretty bad. Mm. National Rail, those are the days. Yes, and the man here in the front, the blue shirt. Sorry, I'm actually agreeing with that point, really. I used to travel on a train 35 years ago, and it was pretty poor. I think it generally is better now, so I do struggle with privatisation. So you wouldn't want to go back there? No. OK, Tom. I, I just find it extraordinary that we've gone through an enormous economic upheaval in this country. Every single private sector business is having to restructure, is having to do things differently, and yes, is having to find places to save costs. And yet we expect that the public sector, almost uniquely, doesn't have to make any of those same decisions. That every single public sector employee uh, in the railways can expect that their lives can continue completely uninterrupted uh, compared to anyone in the private sector. I think that's an extraordinary position to find ourselves in and uh, listening to the Prime Minister speaking today some of the reforms that are uh, needing to be made to the railways there are some ticket uh, booths around the country that sell about one ticket a week. Do these need to be manned all the time? Probably not. Any rational business would think it would be rational to modernise, to update and move forward. And yet the RMT doesn't want to do anything like that. They want to freeze the railways in time, not make any new changes. And that's just, a, that's just not a sensible way that we can run any kind of national infrastructure. And there's just one more point I'd want to make, because this is national infrastructure. We saw during Covid how important the railways were. They were classed as something that was of national importance. They had to keep running. And I think that there are certain points of national important infrastructure that does need to keep running. And perhaps potentially we can learn from some of these European countries you were mentioning, Wes. We could learn from Spain, we could learn from Belgium, we could learn from France, we can learn from Italy, which all ban national strikes on their railways. That's a sensible policy that can keep us moving. And it would be a good point for the government to take up. Sorry. Um, I, yeah, I mean, you, you won't often hear me saying I agree with Tom, but I, I do agree with Tom on this. The, effectively, the RMT are in a monopoly position. And when you're in a monopoly position, the RMT has actually been a very, very effective union on behalf of its members for many years. They've secured a situation where signalers are now getting £44,000 a year, where there are very, very, uh, very positive terms and conditions for their members in many, many parts of the country. And we cannot allow people to ransom the country in this way. Instead, we need to approach it in the way that we think about negotiations with the police or prison officers who have a public sector review pay body and who are not permitted to strike and follow the examples of France, Spain and Italy. We cannot have the public ransomed in this way. Man here in the front. Get to it. Still, this will lay this point. When the railway has gone on strike, it affects so many other people. They have a disproportionate amount of power compared to, say, people in the hospitality or manufacturing sector. When they strike, they're only affecting themselves and the organisations they work for. And, you know, self-employed person, if they can't get to work, they don't get paid either. And the RMT using members of the public as hostages in their pay negotiation this way is absolutely disgraceful. Um, Chris, I, I saw you nodding along when uh, Tom and Rory both mm. mentioned the idea of following the example of some European countries mm. and, and having a minimum requirement for the railways mm. to run so that, so that people can get to work. I mean, this was in the 2019 mm. Conservative Manifesto. Why have you not done it? That's right. Well, it was also in a private member's bill, which I introduced to Parliament when I was a backbencher a few years ago. Exactly this idea. Um, for the reasons that Tom and Rory laid out, having so a why, public why sector... Why has it not happened? Well, I think we're now actively looking at it for very obvious uh, reasons. It was in the manifesto. It is now being actively looked at. I introduced it when I was a backbencher because it is unacceptable. By the way, to answer the question, I completely oppose these strikes. The idea you have a union, trade union monopoly 
holding the country to ransom, stopping, as Layla said, school children getting to school to do their GCSEs, stopping doctors and nurses getting to hospitals, patients getting their treatment, people getting to work and going about their daily business in order to extract better terms than people working in other parts of the economy are able to get is unfair and unacceptable. And the fact that the reason that Labour voted against my private member's bill, which is very unusual, most private member's bills are sort of uncontroversial and nobody complains, Labour voted, probably including Wes, I voted did. against, voted, the reason Wes and his friends voted against my private member's bill, the reason they're equivocating, as you heard earlier, about this strike is they're obviously, they're in hoc, to the RMT no, and to I, Asleth. And I think the Labour Party should start representing the people and not their trade union paymasters. Right, I think okay. I just should come back on that because... <laughs> I'm sorry. Two things. Just, just on some points of fact. The RMT hasn't been affiliated to the Labour Party for about 20 years. That's the first fact. Secondly, the RMT does not have a monopoly position, not least because we don't have monopoly railways and we have more than one railway union. That's the second fact. And the third thing I'd say is, of course, it's an inconvenience. It inconvenienced me going to work on Monday. It's going to inconvenience me, inconvenience yes, me going the, to see the my mum later in, London, in the... Yeah, and with the railway strike, it's going to inconvenience me going to see my mum. I don't downplay the disruption. It's a pain in the backside when it happens. But this idea that we pick, work, pick worker against worker and say that it's transport workers versus nurses or teachers versus uh, doctors, it, this is a nonsense. People are understandably fighting for better pay, jobs, terms and conditions. And whether you're earning... The minimum wage, £20,000, £30,000, £40,000. If your job is at risk and you think you're about to lose your job overnight, who could go like that without their job overnight? Of course they're fighting for their terms and conditions, but the thing to hold on to, and where I think Tom Mitts represented RMT's position, they do understand that the job structure in the railways is going to change, not least because of technology. Of course they do. But you need a fair transition, fair compensation for workers, reallocating people where they can be from the job they're doing now to the jobs we'll need them to do. That's the negotiation to be had and government should be getting people around the table to help make, negotiate a solution to make sure the strikes don't happen. That's what a responsible government would do. That's what a Labour government would do. But this government just wants to bash Wes, the unions. No, no. It's a distract from its own problems. The, 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 the RMT are refusing to negotiate, first of all. Secondly, I, mean, I encountered this when they had the strikes on Southern Railway that went through Croydon. They are pretty militant. They're not interested in negotiation. As far as they're concerned, everybody should have jobs for life. And in the economy, the modern economy, that's just not how things work. Um, you know, train drivers are getting paid, I think, oh, more than you mentioned. They're getting yeah, paid 60-odd. Well, like yeah, 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 that was the average. They're, they're, getting paid, they're not getting paid as much as the Prime they're getting, Minister. They're getting paid, it's very you know, easy to try and get, play the politics paid. of envy and pit they're, worker against they're worker. Paid. Well, I'm not pitting worker they're against worker. They're just fighting worker. for their jobs. OK, I, I'm you, talking what about you're doing is you're shouting. So, OK. Chris, just make your point, please. I was going to say, look, I'm talking about the public interest. I don't want to see us return to the 1970s, where the country and the economy get shut down by militant strikes. West Streeting and the people that voted against my bill in the Labour Party may want to see that, but we don't. OK. All right. On one final yeah, okay. Briefly, Tom. OK. I think we do need to look at modernisation here. It's been decades. For decades, the Parisian metro has run without drivers. This is not beyond the wit of man. The DLR runs without drivers. And yet it's the unions that are stopping the tube system running without drivers, and that's holding up London again and again and again. There are really obvious ways that we can get a more efficient, mm. more effective, uh, modernised, technology-based service. But as long as the unions continue to exercise the power they do, that will hold our country back. Yeah. Okay. So. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on, take another question. From Sam Robinson. The average cost to fill a tank of petrol is now one hundred pounds. Could I please ask what are the immediate short term plans that are realistically available to address this? And how much of an issue is that for you, Sam? It's a major issue, you know, both me and my partner um, we drive together but it's still quite expensive for us to commute from our home to our place of work. OK. And you want to know immediate short-term plans realistically available? Realistic, yeah. Chris? Yeah, well, it's a real issue. I mean, no question about it. With petrol now at 180-odd a litre. It's affecting countries, Western countries around the world. The USA, Germany, France um, are suffering just as we are suffering as well. Um, I think there are two things. Firstly, there are the immediate issues and or the immediate measures. And then there's what we can do in the medium and longer but term. But you're being asked about the immediate short-term well, OK, plans. so the immediate short-term stuff, and we've cut fuel duty by 5p. The Chancellor, a couple of weeks ago... Well, hang on, let me finish. The, the Chancellor, a couple of weeks ago, uh, announced a £15 billion package that for the people on the lower third of incomes, that's about 8 million households around the country, 
are going to get an extra £1,200 in the coming months. That breaks down to £650 in July, and I think half in July, again in October, £400 as an energy rebate, and that's a grant. You haven't got to pay it back now in October, and the £150 uh, council tax rebate. That adds up to £1,200. So those are the, and the package of those measures and others adds up actually to, to this year so far £37 billion, of which £15 billion was two weeks ago. So that will help a lot. But I think uh, we need to think about the longer term as well, because this is a, a kind of structural issue. And there are four or five um, kind of elements to this. And oh my just... God, hang on. We'll be here all night if you're going to four <laughs> well, or five. It's a, it's a big... <laughs> the question was about short term. Well, give, are... give us a couple of long term yeah. if you well, really want I to think, squeeze it I mean, in. I think the, the energy security policy is one. So de generating more of our electricity here domestically. Um, I think getting more people back into the workforce will put down the pressure on prices. Um, and I think... Uh, doing more trade deals around the world okay. to reduce the cost of goods coming in. All of those things in the medium term will help as well. Sam, you asked about short-term plans. Does that answer your question? Not really, no. What, what do you want to hear? So I want to hear something that will make an immediate impact on the price of petrol that when we go to the petrol station, you know, something that will have a tangible impact on that. So a cut in VAT, a cut in duty, that kind of thing. You're yeah. going to have probably £1,200 in your pocket in the course of the next four or five months. I mean, that is a pretty significant contribution, I would say. Wouldn't you agree? Is that for everyone or is that for...? That's for the lower one-third of incomes. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> right. But people on higher okay. incomes get, get smaller amounts okay. of money as well. I mean, that's supposed to help with energy bills as well, don't forget. There's yeah. that, that going on too. Uh, Wes, Sam's asking a very specific question because people are now having to, to fork out to fill yeah. up their cars as of now. Yeah. So what are our Labour's immediate short-term plans realistically available? So that's why we think there should be an emergency budget. We don't think the national insurance rise should be going ahead. We're the only country in the G7 where a finance minister is increasing tax on people's incomes, the only one in the G7. Scrapping that hike would help everyone. Uh, action on business rates, of course, it's not just families that are affected, small business in particular, so help for small businesses, many of whom rely on that fuel and we're paying through the nose for it. Action on VAT, those are things that the government could and should be doing. And of course they say, oh, you know, we, we have to find the money from somewhere, but this is the thing about this Chancellor. Not only did we have to drag him kicking and screaming to do the windfall tax on oil and gas companies because the Prime Minister was pleading poverty on behalf of these companies that are making excess record profits and saying they didn't know what to do with all the money that they had, to drag them kicking and screaming to, um, to do that. Uh, so just to be clear, are you suggesting, Wes... Second houses, third houses, okay. fourth houses get extra payments for each right. and every one Just of to be clear, houses. on petrol, not fair. It's not progressive are you it's not suggesting, OK, you. Wes, are you suggesting, I think you just did, that, that Labour wants to cut VAT on fuel? Because I know you, Labour is suggesting on energy bills. Are yeah, you saying on, you're suggesting on, on fuel on, as well? No, on, on, so energy, the first time I've on, heard on, it. on energy bills, the action on VAT on energy bills, but that would help. Because the problem, the, problem with the, well, the problem with the fuel duty cut, as I think Chris just explained, you cut 5p off the fuel duty, even where that 5p's been passed on, it's been dwarfed by the rising prices. Now, to be fair, this is a global phenomenon, so it's not that we're, we're unique as a country in terms of the, the hike in fuel prices, but taking specific action on fuel duty and continuing to adjust that is probably not the way the most effective okay. and fast way to get money into people's pockets. That's why we need an emergency budget okay, you've to get made that more point. money into people's pockets. Sam, does that answer your question? A bit better, yes. A bit better, OK. Thank so you. we're getting somewhere now. Tom? 46% of the money spent on petrol is tax. 46% of every pound that is spent on the petrol you buy is taken by the state. Taking five pence off, off fuel duty is nothing. I mean, even European countries are doing far more than that, doing 20 pence, etc. It's, it's extraordinary that the politicians on this panel so far have not been able to say that the Chancellor, instead of taxing people here and then spending money there, giving 15 billion there, giving 57 billion there, as if spending more taxpayers' money, unfunded as it is, will do anything to assuage inflation in this country, which is a monetary phenomenon. It's extraordinary that politicians, instead of wanting to take cash from some places and put it there and move it around and slosh it about and inflate the whole uh, uh, prices in the process. Why don't politicians just stop taking so much money from the cost of fuel in the first place? They could halve the price of fuel if they stopped taking cash from it. OK. Is that this woman in the front here? Yes. 
I think this could be a golden opportunity. Isn't it time that government started prioritising public transport? Um, is it 65, 70% of journeys are under two miles? We need an efficient, effective and cheap public transport system that is integrated. And it's about time people started jumping out of their bubble and thinking about what ordinary people need to do and that's also an excellent way of moving towards our net zero target of 2050. We're just encouraging people. Okay. Right. We're encouraging people to stay in their bubbles. Now, get out of your car, walk, cycle. I don't have a car. I haven't had a car for about six years now. And I manage... And I think people can if they start thinking differently. So, government, this is your opportunity. Right. Thank you. And the, <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, the woman there, yes. I have just spent the last 10 days plus visiting my dad backwards and forwards to hospital, taking my mum, got him home in my car. If any of you want to pay my fuel bill that I now have from a lot of unexpected journeys, you are more than welcome. As you said, the massive amount of tax on fuel is horrific. It could be changed very quickly to help an awful lot of us short term. I agree it won't solve the problem long term, but by golly, it would make a difference when things happen that are unexpected and you have no choice. Leila Moran, is that what the Lib Dems would do? Cut the amount of tax? Well, actually, yes. So what we have proposed is a cut on VAT, but not just on fuel, for everything. Because why yes, this you're matters... you're suggesting from 20% to 17.5%. That's right. And why this matters is because it's not just about one thing right now that's expensive. Everything is expensive. Everything hurts. I was contacted by a nurse in my area. So she's a single mum. She's got two kids. She uses her car. She's a district nurse. So she goes round to people's houses to care, perhaps for people like your dad returning from hospital. And she's now at the point where that costs her so much to do that she's making choices about what she can put on the table for her children. So it's not just, I don't think tackling just the fuel bit of it is the right answer. So we are proposing a cut in VAT. And it's worth pointing out that with rising inflation, VAT's on everything, everything we, well, most things that we buy, that inflation goes up, the amount that Rishi Sunak gets from the Treasury goes up. We, the Treasury is getting 24 million extra pounds a day because of inflation. We think that he should be reinvesting that in people, and that's what would pay for the cut. It would be worth 600 pounds per family per year. It would later costs are going up too. The the, what the government spends yes. on things goes up as well, so it's not quite as, quite as easy. It's not quite as easy, but it, I, don't, you, I, I just think it makes so much sense. They are getting more money. No one expected this inflation quite at this rate. Let's reinvest it in people. Let's put it back in okay. people's pockets. And then for the lady who takes the bus, it can help subsidise your bus fare. For the gentleman who drives, it helps you. You guys get to decide how you spend your own money. OK. Since I've asked Sam with the other two politicians, I'm going to ask you with Leila as well, does that answer your question? I'd say, actually, Tom's idea was probably the most insightful, you know, in terms of the opportunity for an, an immediate reduction. You know, the sheer amount of tax that's on, on fuel seems very good. Okay. Can I, can I OK, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll come, I'll, let me just get around the rest of the panel. The man there in the pink shirt, yes, with the glasses. Yes, the, um, I think the tax you'll find is 55%, uh, because it's 35% it's fuel levy plus 20% VAT, so that's 55p. To put that into the real terms, uh, £1.81, that's a pound of that is going to the government to use as taxation. If you want to do something simple and quick, reduce the amount of VAT and reduce the amount of fuel, view, um, fuel duty. You've also got the, do the oil price is going up. It's 128 today. It's going to go higher, which means that it'll be, it's already six times over, six in, um, sorry, six increases since the five pence was given back in March. So it doesn't mean anything. It's a very simple thing. Cut the two put the money in and prepare for the future because there's an impact as well to goods and services which will do the cost of living again because your Sainsbury's lorries need to put um, fuel in their, their tanks and that's costing them. So it's going to be double bubble, if you want to call it that, down the road. You could do it very simply, just cut the two, cut them for five years, bring it down because at the moment the price going up is just fueling the Treasury's pockets. Really? I'm very surprised the government hasn't pushed ahead with reducing VAT on energy. It was something they committed to. In fact, many people who campaigned for Brexit said it was one of the great advantages leaving the European Union, is that you could vary the VAT. So that's one, one step the government should take immediately. 
But I think there's a stronger argument for reducing tax on petrol, for example, and energy in general, which is that we are moving, as the lady pointed out, towards a world in which we're going to get less and less dependent on this. The government needs to start reducing its reliance on this type of income now. The Treasury is trying to keep itself going on a dwindling base. It's going to get less and less money from this, and it needs to start preparing. And this is a good opportunity for that. Start cutting those taxes. It's good for your cost of living. And it's actually what the government needs to learn to do very, very quickly. OK. The, the man there in the suit and tie. Yes. Yes, regarding small businesses, with all the uh, allowances for the uh, electricity uh, allowed for all the private people, but small businesses where you've got like a, a news agents or a hairdressers who've got triple now electricity bills and they're getting no support from the government whatsoever. And these are the backbone of the UK uh, economy and they're getting no support from the government whatsoever. What, what are the government going to do for the small business and the man on the street where you've got the multinationals yeah. that can cover that expense when their electricity bill is up because all they just put the prices up. But the small business and the corner shop man, the hairdresser, salon and things like that, they've got no way of getting there. They've, Bills are like three times more than what they were, but they can't put their prices up. OK. And the man there in the white shirt? It wouldn't be so bad if there was actually a shortage of oil, but um, OPEC have patently refused to increase production, and as a result, they're keeping the price artificially high, which for those of us of a certain age can remember when the Middle Eastern countries back in the 70s did this, and pretty much... <laughs> pretty much uh, destroyed many of the Western economies. We need internationally to do something about this and address this at that level. Otherwise, it will continue to be exploited by those people who are benefiting from it most. OK. Chris, you want to come back and answer some of these Yeah, questions? this has been a really um, good debate. I wanted to offer one word of caution and then a word of hope. The word of caution first. I mean, the, the truth is, we've come through a really difficult economic situation with COVID. We do have to pay for public services. And the fact we've got record NHS spending, more doctors and nurses than ever before, the extra police officers and everything. The truth is that does have to be paid for. And while tax receipts may be going up because of inflation, as Leila said, the money the government spends on things is going up as well because inflation affects government services as much as it affects uh, you and me in our daily lives. So we do need to make sure these, public, these important public services like the NHS are properly funded. And the only way things get funded is through tax. I mean, that is the word of caution. Now the word of hope. I think now we are getting through the aftermath of COVID. And as we get through this cost of living situation, um, I think, as a, as a speaking for myself, I think that lower taxes uh, stimulate economic growth and can offer us a way of growing out of these problems. So I think in the autumn budget, what I am uh, hoping, and I maybe even would go as far as saying expecting to see, are some targeted tax reductions, things like um, R&D tax credits that stimulate investment. The Chancellor has already said we're going to be cutting income tax by a penny in the pound. And the gentleman it's asked terrible. about the, the gentleman asked about the gentleman asked about the gentleman asked about small business. We had, there was a small business rate relief, I think fifty percent small business rate relief um, that was renewed in April of this year. But I do believe as a Conservative that finding ways of cutting taxes, including by making the public sector more efficient Right, which is to, to the point about um, rail reform and NHS reform. If we can do that, then we can cut taxes, stimulate growth. And over the medium term, that is how we're going to sort our economy out and fix these issues. So cutting income tax at the moment by 1% is exactly the wrong thing to do. Making the cuts on fuel duty and petrol is a smart thing to do. But people on the lowest incomes who are suffering most at the moment are not paying income tax. That cut of the 1% on income tax will not help the people who are really struggling, but reducing energy bills and fuel costs will make a real difference. Income tax costs, cuts is a bad mistake. Well, okay. I disagree, but on that, so on the point about low income... No, no, hang on, hang on, also... hang on. No, Chris, I've let you talk so you much, have, and sorry. otherwise no-one else will come. Leila, very quickly, you want well, to come very in. quickly to say, I mean, I think the lady earlier made this point that actually this is our opportunity to wean ourselves off, you know, dirty fossil fuels. We look back at... Decisions the government made, like cutting the subsidy on electric cars, that was a really bad idea in this context. And actually, this is more medium term, and I appreciate your question was about short term. But I, I do hope that the government's now learned its lesson. You know, cutting the green crap, uh, as David Cameron said, was a really bad idea. Uh, we've got a huge issue of climate change coming down the road at us. This is an opportunity. We should grasp this nettle, wean ourselves off the petrol completely. Then we won't have to pay such high prices in the first place because we don't need it. All right. I'm going to move on to another question. From Richard. Richard Catling. Where are you? Oh, there you are. Sorry. Will extending the right to buy to housing associations 
provide a further shortage of rented accommodation and therefore push up rents. So this is something, of course, that the Prime Minister has been talking about today. Um, Tom. So uh, I rent. I, I might be the only person on the panel who doesn't own my own home. And, and this is something that is such an important issue and something I care about so much. And just about anyone under the age of about 45 these days cares about so much. The housing situation in this country is just so very broken. Uh, housing and wages had tracked each other. The, 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 the cost of housing and the growth in earnings tracked each other until the late 1990s and then something happened and, and house prices just spiralled out of control. Wages continued to rise but not by anywhere near enough. And what has happened for the last 20, 30 years is we have not been building anywhere near enough houses. And Tom, can I so just point out that the question is about housing associations. So when it comes to specific questions about helping and alleviating issues and, <laughs> and saying whether it's 95% mortgages or help to buy with housing associations or anything else, frankly, that is just playing around with things that don't solve the issue because the issue is supply. And you'll find that people will be able to get on the housing ladder so much more easily whether they're renting in housing associations, whether they're renting on the private market, or whether they're struggling in some other way. Unless we are building more than 300,000 homes a year, unless we are actually keeping pace with demand, this is going to become a bigger and bigger issue, and we're going to see greater inequality. And there's something else. I, I think I almost subscribe to something called the housing theory of everything. Because almost everything is tied up in housing. If you're spending so much of your cash on housing, if you're not able to live near where you want to work, if you're not able to have enough bedrooms, I mean, this, this feeds into the fertility crisis, the climate crisis, this feeds into the productivity crisis. Housing feeds into everything. And until as a society we're grown up enough to say that actually sometimes we need to suck it up and build some houses, and yes, that might mean some more houses near where people live, and yes, occasionally a field might need to be built on. Less than 2% of the country is built on with housing right now. Yes, we need to build. It's a fact of life. It has to happen. And until politicians accept that fact, we're going to be getting into a worse situation. Leila. So just, just to be specific, yeah. because the question is, will extending the right to buy to housing associations actually provide a further shortage of rented accommodation? I, I think that, that is a huge risk. Um, and the concern is that what we have here is a policy, and actually um, I understand this policy has appeared before. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it was as far back as the 2015 uh, Conservative general election manifesto. So it's rather reheated leftover of a policy on a day where maybe it was convenient to have a policy that maybe evoked the ghost of Margaret Thatcher. That would be a useful thing for Boris Johnson to do right now. I mean, call me a cynic, but let's just stick to what they're trying to propose. Um, I, I'm really, really worried uh, if this does go ahead. Um, in places like Oxfordshire, where I am from, there is a chronic shortage of affordable, truly affordable, not, not what the government says is affordable. The government says affordable is 80% of market value. I would imagine in places like Dorking that that's just beyond 80% of market value. No one can touch that. And what that means, actually to agree with Tom, is that you end up with people who were born somewhere, have deep roots, and then find themselves having to move away when they get to an age where they want to start a family. The families then get de disconnected. The answer is to build homes, but it's to do it, and this is where we'll differ, Tom, it's to do it with the local communities, to have local plans and local housing numbers that are determined by what communities need, not top-down centralised targets. And then you can have a conversation as a community. How many of those do you want to be affordable? What are they going to look like? Where are okay. they going to be? If something does need to be taken, for example, out of the green belt, it's not done to you, it's done with you. Okay. And it's a completely different approach to where this government is right now. Now, there's three of you in the back there, with, or in a row, with your hands up. So let's hear from all of you. Let, let's let the woman in the green, first of all. 
There's supposed to be a policy in place anywhere that any new developer has a certain percentage of social housing within it. But the number of times I've heard of developers building and then suddenly they haven't got the money to provide those social housings. So you find that you've got estates being built and they're just not providing the social housing that's supposed to come with that. And I thought that was supposed to be law. OK, man next to you. Yeah, it, it, it's not a self kind of induced thing, though, because a lot of countries rent rather than buy. So you think we shouldn't be worrying so much about buying versus renting? I think there's a, a very British thing about owning your house. And of course, own your house. Everyone wants it to go up in value. Mm. So it's self perpetuating in the, in the sense that if you do build social housing somewhere, you can't sell it for half the price of the houses that are in the local area. Otherwise, you're in a tricky situation then. OK, and the woman next to you. If we're going to build more houses, we've got to do the infrastructure, we've yeah. got to have the hospitals. I'm round here with Dorking in Surrey. We have nearest hospitals, we have the Royal Surrey in Guildford, or else we have Red Hill, and that's doing both Surrey and Sussex. It's a huge geographical area, so much building, and we just haven't had the hospitals um, or the infrastructure, and also the schools for all of these executive houses, an executive house or a social house, or come with families. Where's the schools? OK. Uh, Wes? So, so I think that, going back to the, the initial question, I think that is the risk of, of right to buy for housing associations, that there are fewer homes available to rent and rents might go up. The reason I'm not losing too much sleep over it is that this has been promised every year by the Conservatives since 2015, so I'm not sure it's ever going to happen. And to, to that last point, because I get this a lot as a constituency MP, and I think most MPs, when new developments are proposed, this is the number one anxiety. It's not, it's not as simple as nimbyism and not in my backyard. It's a more general anxiety of, you know, I'm struggling to get a GP appointment. I'm worried about school places. Will the local infrastructure be there to cope? All I'd say about that is that in terms of my housing casework and the things that I see, there are two big injustices. One is that kids that are growing up in poverty today don't have the stability of a council flat over the head like my mum had when she was bringing me up. They are being pushed from pillar to post in temporary accommodation, in grotty bedsits, B&Bs, having a miserable experience. We saw that writ large in the pandemic where teachers reported kids you know, having to squabble over who gets the parents' pay-as-you-go phone for the limited amount of data they get as they're all crammed in one room and they're trying to learn together. Parents are struggling to cope and do everything that goes on in those horrible conditions. And, and you know, if that injustice itself isn't bad enough, we pay through the nose as taxpayers subsidising that grotty accommodation. We pay through the nose through the consequences of child poverty in terms of children's learning, in terms of their life chances, in terms of the mental health and well-being of their parents, their ability to go out and find work. We have got such a big social crisis in this country when it comes to child poverty and housing is the, the absolute root to it. And, you know, we are not going to solve this housing crisis unless we build more homes, decent new affordable council homes, decent new housing association homes, homes to buy and homes to rent and affordable homes. That's our priority. It's the only way to solve this problem. And you know, not only would it be great for those people that can get on the housing ladder for the first time in their family's history or can afford their <coughs> rents, we will all save money collectively as a society in the process and children will have a better start in life, better life chance and opportunities. That's the kind of country I want to live in. Chris. So, so will extending yeah. the right to buy to housing associations, this is something the Prime Minister talked about today, provide a further shortage of rented accommodation? No, no, to answer that question, no it won't, because the number of people remains the same, the number of homes remains the same, it's just changing the tenure type. So the, the answer to the question is no. So ha I'm hang a on a minute, hang on a minute, because there was... Yeah. Just let me understand that, because there was, the government's done a pilot of this in the Midlands yeah. in 2018, and less than a third of the homes that were sold were replaced as a result of that pilot. So where do people who need but, to then go on the Social Housing Association, how do they But the point is, that, but the person who exercises that right to buy, by definition, is somebody who was on the Social Housing Register. They then exercise their right to buy. So the number of people on the Social Housing Register goes down by one. No, but what about all the people the on the Social Housing waiting list? Yeah. Where but, are they going to live? But the balance between stock and people 
stays the same because each goes down by one. You then separately to that, you but build the people more. People on the list obviously can't. Right. So, so, so separately. Am I missing something? No, no, you are. You are. You are. Because because separately to that, obviously, you have to build more homes to meet the inflow, right? So that makes sense. But look, uh, the, the more general. Does it? If you think about it, if you think about it, it does. If you think about it, it does make sense. But I'm not sure, on. Chris. I'm not sure you're convincing maybe, me. Maybe I did a bad job explaining, but it does make sense. But look, there, there's a more general point, which is that I am a big supporter of home ownership in general. Um, currently, 65% of people own their own home, but 86% of people, so over 20% more, would like to, one of whom it sounds like is Tom. So I think it is a, it is a mission for government to help those 20% of people get on the housing ladder. That's important because it gives you stability, to, to Wes's point. Um, it also spreads the fruits of economic growth more widely around society. Now, measures like this are part of that. The fact that first-time buyers buying a property under 300,000 don't pay any stamp duty, whereas second home buyers now pay a 3% stamp duty surcharge helps out as well. But I, but I do agree with the point I think Tom made um, that supply is important. When the last Labour government left office, um, we were only building, I think, 125,000 homes a year. Um, just before the pandemic, we doubled that up to 240,000 homes a year. Um, but, I, but I agree on, on, the, on the point Layla made, I do agree with her, it's important to do that in the, in the right okay. way so communities come with us rather than imposing unwanted development, which does mean, included in that, the right kind of infrastructure. That's a fair point, too. Um, so, I, 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 I agree with Fiona, says he. Um, oh, the, the key point know, I'm not sure anyone's ever said that on the panel before. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm um, yes. um, The key, key, point is, key point is replacement. Um, it, it is true that right to buy did a lot of good for many, many people because they got their hands on a very valuable asset. And that can be very positive in transforming lives. But you must replace that stock. And the problem with what Mrs Thatcher did is not enough high-quality, affordable, rented accommodations was built to replace the council houses that were sold off. And the problem here, again, unfortunately, is the government does not have the money or the plan to replace the accommodation which will be bought. And it's difficult to do, because it's not just about replacing, for example, an a housing association house in the Lake District with a house in Dorking. It's about replacing a housing association house in the Lake District with another house in the Lake District so people can continue to live in their communities. The answer to all of this is the theory is fine, right? The theory of right to buy is fine, but you must put the money into building much more high-quality, affordable, rented accommodation. OK, I've got, a, you've got, I've got a minute, and you said I'd give you five just, seconds. Just for clarity, Michael Gove has secured a commitment from housing associations that those properties sold will all be replaced, just but for clarity. But who will pay for it? Look, the problem, the, the problem is, no, the government didn't pay for it last time. This was the problem. We are this, what time. It, we are this time. It would cost over £3 billion a year for the government to replace that stock. They have not budgeted that money. What they will do is put the pressure on the housing associations and on the local councils, and we will end up with less accommodation at the end. Man here in the check set. Uh, so if you think about immediate short-term solutions, one thing you could do is introduce a rental cap, first of all, which would, uh, which would also um, alleviate some of the problems. Secondly, Chris, you mentioned uh, the £300,000 uh, for um, first-time buyers, but good luck finding something for three hundred grand or under here well, in Dorking. Right. OK, I've got ten um, seconds left. The woman there in the glasses. Um, I was just wondering about sort of financial literacy. So it's all well and good talking about building new homes, but I don't think the younger generation actually understand, well, how do I go about buying a new home and saving for it? As a teacher, I've had students actually say, Miss, how much do I have to earn to actually pay rent when I grow up or buy a house when I grow up? So I'd just be curious, do the panel think we need to include that more in the curriculum as to how to actually... Whoa. Buy a house rather yes. than just build them. Yes. Right. <laughs> Quick nods or, or shakers of head. Lots of nodding. Right. Okay. Because we're out of time. Thank you very much. Okay. So that is it. We're out of time. Our hour is up. Thank you very much to the panel for coming this evening. Thank you much to our audience here in Dorking. Really good to hear all of your opinions. And of course, thank you to you at home for watching from Question Time in Dorking. Bye bye. <laughs>